Welcome to Distrust and Disparities, Dismantling Black Health Disparities podcast. We examine health disparities that disproportionately affect Black women and Black families. In addition, we amplify organizations and individuals working to dismantle racist health practices and systems to improve health outcomes for marginalized communities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Camille White. Hello, Distrust and Disparities listeners. We're just checking in with you guys. Hope you are using this time to relax and also catch up on episodes and also share these episodes with your friends and family. If you're enjoying it, please share and like our episodes like you've always been. We appreciate it. And we are taking a much-needed holiday break during this time while we're also preparing for our next batch of episodes and interviews for 2024. And we wanted to, again, have another rerun episode where we run it back to some of our favorite episodes and ones that really highlight medical injustices and greed. So for this episode... We wanted to run it back to episode 25, where we discuss diabetes and the harmful consequences of insulin rationing. And we also wanted to give you all some updates before the start of the episode. In January 2023, under the Inflation Reduction Act, the out-of-pocket cost of insulin was capped at $35 a month for insulin covered under the Medicare Part D plan. And just want to explain two things. People age 65 years or older are eligible for Medicare, um, which is a federal insurance program. And Medicaid, however, is specifically for individuals younger than 65 years old who meet certain criteria for poverty. And the insulin price caps in certain U.S. states have not had the economic impact many thought that it would have because very few people are actually able to qualify for some of these caps. People with little to no health insurance coverage have reported paying more than $1,000 per month when they have to use higher insulin doses. And like we mentioned in this episode, which you'll hear, or if you are listening again, these are unreasonable prices for um, most people. And this results in rationing their insulin or other priorities such as food, rent, or, you know, paying their phone bills and things like that. And we just want to quote this article from Health Affairs. And it says, it's clear that price caps hold great potential. However, When we focus solely on capping insulin prices rather than changing pharmaceutical pricing practices at large, unintended consequences might affect those who rely on these life-saving medications. It's important to approach the issue of unaffordable insulin with a broader perspective, considering more comprehensive systemic transformations to address drug pricing and affordability. Furthermore, the models of a set monthly price cap, such as the $35 cap set forth by the IRA, may have an unintended negative effect, such as raising premiums. This price cap is it changing the list price of insulin? It's changing the co-payment. This means that payers end up footing the larger bill. So basically saying that they're going to eventually raise the premiums. You're going to be paying more for insurance. So we're not really doing anything. We're just kind of making fragmented changes that kind of just shuffle the money around. We're not forcing pharmaceutical companies to address why what costs four dollars to make and package they're selling for over thousands of dollars and then 
people who are diabetic, it's not only insulin that they need. They need needles. They need um, swabs. They need glucose monitoring machines. They need the um, sensors. It's a lot of things that go with it. And then some people, if you listen to this episode, we explain the difference between type 1 and type 2. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, you have to have insulin. You cannot live without it. Because some people are probably saying, well, it's their choice that they got diabetes. But in actuality, there are some people that are born with diabetes. Um, some people have some autoimmune issues or are on certain medications that cause them to need insulin. So, And also, if we look at medications at large, like chemotherapies, other drugs, hypertension medications, just anything for chronic illnesses, these pharmaceutical companies are just making egregious amounts of money. So it's just not just insulin, but we're just looking at this one specific case. I miss my daughter so much. If pharmaceutical companies were not out for a high profit, she could still be here. She was rationing her insulin because it was just too expensive for us. In this episode, we cover the tragic story of Antavia Godetal Lee Warsham, a young diabetic woman forced to ration her insulin due to absurdly high costs. And we highlight T1 Diabetes Journey, the organization created by Antoinette Warsham, Antavia's mother, who is fighting to change laws and prevent more deaths. So happy new year, distrust and disparities family. We are feeling happy and optimistic about this year. We still going to talk about what's going on, but we are excited to hopefully be getting some change to be shedding light. You know, we want to use our podcast and our platform to shed light on disparities and also on organizations that are working to dismantle these health disparities. So we are excited. We are invigorated. We hope you are feeling the same. Right, Camille? Yes. Happy 2023, you know, brand new year. And hopefully, yes, it brings so many wonderful things to our listeners' lives, our lives, and like you said, we continue going with our goal of this podcast to educate people and point out organizations that are doing mm-hmm. some great work to help with the disparities that we face. Yes. So let's jump right into it. So this week we're going to be discussing diabetes and I just want to review some basic concepts just so that we're all on the same page with um, statistics and also some definitions because even being a nurse, I want to refresh myself, make sure I'm giving you guys the right information. According to the 2020 National Diabetes Statistics Report published by the CDC, Diabetes affects over 34 million people in the U.S., and that breaks down to more than one in 10 people. And I know everybody look, probably knows somebody in their family that has diabetes that has been affected. So that's a lot of people. And that's just the people that have been diagnosed. They say there's possibly about 8 million people that don't know they have diabetes. And then I believe the number is even higher for people who are pre-diabetic. So those numbers are really high. And I believe diabetes is number seven, or it's definitely in the top 10 cause of deaths in the U.S. So according to the CDC, diabetes is a chronic long-standing health condition that affects how your body turns food into energy. So that's just the basic, plain and simple definition of diabetes. And your body breaks down most of the food that you eat into sugar or glucose, and then it releases it into your bloodstream. When your blood sugar goes up, it signals your pancreas to release insulin. And insulin is a hormone. Insulin acts like a key to let the sugar into your body cells that they can use for energy. So hopefully you guys can picture that metaphor. With diabetes, your body doesn't make enough insulin or it can't use the insulin as well as it should. Like those receptors are just not able to take in that insulin. 
And when there isn't enough insulin or the cells stop responding to the insulin, too much blood sugar will stay in your bloodstream. And over time, when there's too much sugar in your bloodstream, it can lead to serious health problems such as heart disease, vision loss, and kidney disease. And those are just some of the top health effects of diabetes. And there are two main types of diabetes. So type 1 and type 2 diabetes are the most common forms of the disease, but there are other kinds such as gestational diabetes, which occurs during pregnancy. Type 1 diabetes is thought to be caused by an immune reaction, which is basically the body attacking itself by mistake. And with type 1 diabetes, this reaction, it stops your body from making insulin. So just think type 1, your body is unable to make insulin. And approximately 5 to 10% of people have what's considered type 1 diabetes. Typically, some of the symptoms with type 1 diabetes, they often develop quickly. And usually with type 1 diabetes, It's diagnosed in children, teens, and young adults. It used to be called juvenile diabetes, but they made it type 1. But it most commonly affects children, teens, and young adults. And with type 1 diabetes, since you don't make insulin on your own, you have to take insulin every day in order to survive because your body does not produce it naturally. Currently, there's no way to prevent type 1 diabetes. With type 2 diabetes, your body doesn't use insulin well, and it can't keep blood sugar at normal levels. And approximately about 90 to 95% of people with diabetes have type 2. And it develops over many years and is usually diagnosed in adults. But in recent years, more and more children and teens are getting type 2 diabetes. And... A lot of times, unlike type 1, you may not notice the symptoms at all. So it's really important when you have your routine checkups that your doctor, your primary care doctor, they test your sugar levels. And also a big risk is if you are overweight or if you have other health issues, they'll be concerned about your sugar as well. With type 2 diabetes, it can be prevented or delayed with healthy lifestyle changes, such as losing weight, eating healthy food, and being active. With diabetes, we also want to touch on the disparities that exist with this chronic disease. According to the National Diabetes Statistics Report, the percentage of U.S. adults 18 and older diagnosed with diabetes, so I'm going to give you the breakdown by race, American Indians, They make up 14.5%, African-Americans at 12.1%, Hispanics at 11.8%, Asians at 9.5%, white at 7.4%. So that's the percentage breakdown by race. And a lot of times people want to place the blames on genetics or biology or just want to blame it on individuals' personal choices alone. However, it's a multifactorial problem, and the research shows that diabetes prevalence is not dependent on race or from just a genetic psychological standpoint. So basically saying just because you're Native American or you're Black, you would be more predisposed to diabetes. They say socioeconomic factors play a huge factor in the disparities. And I just want to point out this one study. So in 2017, the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities found that there was a difference in the quality of diabetes care between racial and ethnic groups. And I'll quickly summarize the results. So compared to white individuals, Hispanic, Black, and Asian individuals received fewer diabetes management checks, including A1C tests an A1C that looks at your blood sugar over a month period. Eye exams, foot exams, blood cholesterol tests, and flu vaccines. Most notably, Hispanics, Blacks, and Asian individuals were less likely to receive 
the two recommended annual A1C checks. And the researchers concluded that this difference in quality of care occurred partly because populations of color had less access to health insurance and also diabetes management and education when compared to white populations. And this is just a brief overview, but diabetes is a very complex disease to manage. And like I said, the symptoms with type 2 diabetes specifically, you won't notice them as much. It kind of like creeps up on you. Like your doctor tells you, oh, your sugar is high. You need to start making some lifestyle adjustments. If you ignore that, like your cells, they become less responded to insulin and your sugar rises and it can affect your eyes, your heart, your kidneys. And if you aren't getting the right education on how to manage it, how to um, look at what you're eating and calculate how much insulin you have to give yourself, understanding that you the importance of checking your sugar three to four times a day, and also you're going to be sticking yourself with a needle up to four times a day. It's a very complex disease to manage. And the research is showing that people from lower income households and also Black and minority patients, they just aren't receiving the education to understand what they need to do to manage their diabetes. And it's just sad. And like I said, diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. And I've known so many people that have lost toes, feet. It's affecting their vision, affecting their heart. It's just sad. And I'll point out this one thing before we move on, and I'll let you comment, Camille. Just the stark difference in care, because just working in a busy city hospital, so many people just didn't understand how to manage their diabetes and when to take their medication correctly. And then when I went to a hospital that was in a wealthy neighborhood, people are like, oh, I have a nutritionist. I have an endocrinologist. That's somebody who specializes in the pancreas and understands how to manage your diabetes. They also see a diabetes educator and specialist. They just have so much excess with their insurance and their doctors are recommending they get these necessary tests done and that they have the support they need to manage their diabetes. Yeah, that's always the problem when it comes to not only the way that our insurance and healthcare is set up in this country, where if you are poor, if you are lower income, you don't have the access to that. And that's bullshit because healthcare and access to, you know, equitable healthcare is a human right. It shouldn't be based on, you know, how much money your household has. Therefore, you know, whatever job you have, then the insurance that you have access to and therefore what doctors you have access to who are then going to tell you like, oh, hey, I can hook you up with this nutritionist and this person and that mm -hmm. person that's really going to help you maintain a good quality of life because like you said it's a chronic illness this is a chronic disease that you'll have to live with the rest of your life so you'll have some people that won't have to go through the hardships that so many others do every day like you said losing limbs and suffering so many other uh terrible consequences of diabetes when it's not managed properly mm -hmm. It's just a complex problem. And I know a lot of people be like, well, why can't they just lose weight or why can't they do this? You don't know how much money they are making, the insurance mm -hmm. that they have access to. Say they go to one doctor's appointment, the doctor's like, oh, you need to lose weight. But they don't really tell them what they need to do. They try to make changes or they work in a very stressful job and position. And, you know, stress can also affect your metabolic rate and, mm -hmm. you know, hormones and different things. So you can't strictly just blame it on the individual. Yes, you do have to take responsibility of things, but it's such a complex problem. And a huge part of the disparities lie in excess income where you live at. Mm -hmm. Even if you have access to healthy foods, do you have the time to cook those foods to be able to prepare it for such a large family? So. 
yes, we want to stress education, but if we can get rid of some of these hurdles and obstacles that low income and minority people have to go through to make it a little bit easier, it makes such a difference. And this week's main story will highlight how income and the insurance how it affects your access to just having access to life-saving medications and treatments. Have you checked out our website? There you can find all of our episodes and show notes. You can even listen directly on the site and catch up on any previous episode you may have missed. You can read our bios and see what we're up to. Also, we made it even easier to contact us. Just fill out the form on our homepage and click submit. We invite you to recommend guests and topics we should feature. So what are you waiting for? Go check us out at distrustanddisparities.com. For our main story, we want to talk about Antoinette Warsham. She's a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, and a mother of four. And she has two daughters, Antavia and Antonique, who both have type 1 diabetes. Her oldest daughter, Antavia, was diagnosed at age 16, and her other daughter, Antonique, was diagnosed at age 12. And Antavia, she was in high school when she was first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Her mom wrote on her website that she struggled with managing her diabetes after she was first diagnosed, but she eventually prevailed. And Like we were talking about in the pre-discussion, diabetes is a very complex disease to manage. And especially with type 1 diabetes, just imagine being a child and you have to stick yourself multiple times. Or sometimes there is a device that you can wear that tells you your blood sugar. But that might be new. I don't know if they had that back then. I know in high school, my diet was probably trash. I was eating on like an irregular schedule. So I can just imagine just figuring out how much insulin to give yourself based off your diet. So I can only imagine how hard that was being a newly diagnosed diabetic in high school. And Tavia, she eventually graduated from high school in 2013 and she continued on to college at Cincinnati State Technical College. In 2016, Antavia turned 21, and unfortunately, she was kicked off her state's insurance program, which was which was the Bureau for Children of Medical Handicaps, and that's an Ohio program that provides aid to those with disabilities and other medical conditions. The program, it ends at 21. At the time, Antavia, she worked two jobs. She was a seasonal employee at the Paul Brown football stadium, and she also worked full time for a security company at the Delta building. She had insurance through the company, but still, the price of insulin and her supplies was very steep. So she's 21 at the time. And with her insurance, it reportedly cost her $1,200 to $1,300 for a 90-day supply of insulin. And that's not factoring in the supplies. So just imagine you're 21, you're trying to go to school, you're working two jobs, and it's going to cost you $1,300 or more for a life-saving medication that you need. That's insane. Like right. I did not I did not have that money at that age to no. you like set aside for that. Like that's something that you have to mm-hmm. get. And I can imagine it was probably free with a combination of her being on her mom's insurance and then getting that assistance program. And then just imagine at twenty one, they tell you it's gonna cost you thirteen hundred dollars a month to pay for insulin. And mind you, you need this medication to survive. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Antavia had to begin doing what is called insulin rationing. And insulin rationing is the act of skipping insulin injections or not taking enough in order to prolong each dose. 
I wasn't familiar with this term, but after seeing the definition, it's like, oh, and I can see when I was in the hospital, some patients and they're like, oh, this is all the medication I have. Or when they leave the hospital, like, oh, can I have the rest of that insulin? What is that? Can I have this? They're like, oh, can I get medication to go? And unfortunately, one in four patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes report using less insulin than prescribed due to high costs. Not taking the recommended amount of insulin has deadly consequences. In 2017, Antavia was found by her brother unresponsive with an empty insulin pen. The cause of her death was diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a condition in which acid builds up in the body when sugar levels get dangerously high, often resulting in a coma or death. And Tavia's mom, Antoinette, she didn't realize her daughter was rationing insulin. And she's quoted later as saying she used her sister's insulin or used her grandpa's insulin until she no longer could borrow any of their insulin. And she was like, I didn't know she was rationing. She did try to get help from resources. Those resources were limited because of her income and also because of her mom's income. She could not get extra help. She was kicked off the Medicaid because of her income. So at this point, how do Americans become eligible? So she's doing everything she can to get assistance to pay for this medication. The healthcare system in this country is trash because to qualify for certain programs, you have to make below the poverty level. So even if you're working minimum wage or you work in two jobs that can easily kick you barely over the poverty level. And then Mm -hmm. if you were to do a spreadsheet with your income, probably 99% of her income would go to pay for insulin. Like this should be illegal. Like how is this possible? Or even as she's reaching age 21, you would think they would help her set up like, hey, you, sh- you can apply for this program. This is going on. You wouldn't expect it to be such a steep amount, 1300 Say you're paying, I think they say average in the U.S., the average file of insulin is about $300. So say she was paying at the max $300 a month for it to go to $1,300 a month. And we don't know how much like supplies pens, needles, and all that other stuff, lancets costs. That's crazy. That is completely insane because, like, it's life-saving medication. And Will sort of discussed, too, uh, just pricing alone later on. But it's ridiculous, and it's the way our healthcare system is set up and also how they then allow pharmaceutical companies that, of course, people are relying mm-hmm. on to just fully take advantage of us where we Mm -hmm. need what they're making and they're looking at it as a business, which of course, understandable, but like people's lives are at stake and you are charging Mm -hmm. a ridiculous amount more money than what something actually costs you to make. I can understand trying to make a little profit. Y'all are making billions and people are dying because they can't afford your product. That is Mm -hmm. ridiculous. Now we want to move into Antoinette's advocacy that she started because, of course, Antoinette was heartbroken over the death of her daughter, Antavia. And she also admits that she was not fully aware of the consequences of insulin rationing and that it could possibly lead to death. And, of course, then, like we mentioned earlier, she has another daughter, Antonique, who is also a type 1 diabetic. So realizing that, you know, Antonique was 18 at the time and that she would face the same challenges as Antavia in two years, where you're just getting kicked off of the system and something that you need to survive is no longer provided for you. You don't have access to it in the same way you, you did previously. So that was when Antoinette really 
sort of realized and understood that like she needed to do something to bring awareness to what was going on. And you see this time and time again where you have family members, spouses, parents go through something so tragic as losing someone and that then motivates them to try and help other people, which is, you know, the one bright side out of all of this. Prior to her death, she was doing everything that she could. You know, her daughter had insurance. She was working a job. You wouldn't think she would end up dying six years after she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. It's just sad. And a lot of times we have insurance and if we don't use it, it's like, okay, we're fine. We're healthy. But we don't understand like these insurance companies are taking advantage of us. It's not until, say, we have to have like a really uh, serious procedure and they hit you with this crazy, insane bill or you need like a specific medication and they're charging you a crazy price. And it's sad that you don't realize until something bad happens, like the worst possible consequences that the healthcare system and these pharmaceutical companies are just taking complete advantage over us. It's just ridiculous that Mm -hmm. it's profits over people. Yeah, which is a terrible way to run any business, especially Mm -hmm. when you're in the business of providing life-saving medications and other things that people need. This isn't, you know, an elective sort of thing or, you know, she just wanted insulin. Like, no, she needed insulin to live. Right. So Antoinette began to attend protests and advocate for changes for her daughter and others with type 1 diabetes. She even went to protests outside of Sanofi Drug Company, which is in Cambridge, New Massachusetts. It's one of the largest manufacturers of insulin. And Antoinette was with three other parents who had also lost their children for the same exact reason of insulin rationing. And they wanted to make a statement by delivering the ashes of their children to the CEO. However, the protest was shut down because the pharmaceutical company shut down the building and threatened to arrest protesters. And one protester pointed out that, quote, the only innovative solution we want from insulin makers is lower prices. Antoinette also, even in her advocacy efforts, was involved in a documentary. And they drove to Canada to compare the insulin price difference between the U.S. and Canada. It was 10 times cheaper in Canada than in the U.S. to purchase the same vial of insulin made by the same exact pharmaceutical company. So like we've said, it's trash. Our system is trash. Mm. The same company should not be deciding, depending on what country they're selling to, how much they're going to sell it for. The Mm. fact that you could just go to Canada and get it 10 times cheaper is is ridiculous. Yeah, the same company is selling it for 10 times more in America. And that just shows here in America, we let pharmaceuticals dictate the price of drugs and how much they're going to charge. It's insane. And I believe I was listening to another podcast. They were saying in other countries, they bargain against the pharmaceuticals so that they can't charge insane prices or say the pharmaceutical company, they want to charge a certain amount. They buy it in bulk and they have programs that they give it out to make sure if you have diabetes, you have access to this medication and that you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Because like those are countries that are trying to help their citizens, that are caring for their citizens in some way or another. We we give these companies so much power. And then it makes me think of, too, how not that long ago, the state of California was like, hey, we're going to start making insulin since it's so ridiculously yeah. priced. Mm-hmm. I think it was like a study. They looked at the price of insulin, and I believe from like 2014 on up, just the price has steadily gone up, gone up. And it's not like they're doing anything new, like this is some special insulin that is working like extra special. There's no cure for diabetes and 
insulin is what diabetics need to survive. And they know this and they're like, they are going to pay for this money and we're going to squeeze out as much profits as we can. And the statistics show that about one in three people, they are rationing their insulin. At the extreme end, it can lead to death and a coma, which unfortunately happened to Octavia. But this is leading to complications such as why you see so many people getting their toes cut off because it affects your vessels in your blood. You have like the buildup of plaque. It's hardening your arteries. Um, A lot of people, they get what's called, I don't know why I can't think of it, but when you have like the numbness and tingling, you can't feel things. It can just lead to so many complications. Vision changes, your kidneys, diabetes can slowly affect almost every organ in your body. And so many people need this medication and just the prices that they're charging in the U.S. is outrageous. So later on with Antoinette's advocacy efforts, she ended up speaking to Congress in 2019. She was actually invited by the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. And it was a hearing before the House Committee of Oversight and Reform regarding drug prices and cost. And Antoinette shared her story and just how she fears that her other daughter, Antonique, with diabetes would suffer the same consequences as Antavia. Antoinette pointed out how type 1 diabetics, they need insulin to survive and that the consequences of insulin rationing is not getting the attention it deserves. She also pointed out that the steadily rising cost of insulin and how pharmaceutical companies are getting away with prioritizing profits over people is just completely insane, like we've said. Mm -hmm. Because it costs most pharmaceutical companies between $3.69 to about $6.16 to manufacture one vial of insulin. Yet, Americans, what do we pay? We pay, on average, $300 per vial. Jeez. Like, the upcharge. It's, again, understand that you're running a business and you need to have a profit in order to have money to continue to run your business. But that is insane. That profit margin mm-hmm. is insane because you care more about money than you care about people. And you're literally a pharmaceutical company where your whole goal is making drugs so our lives can be better. And some people, if you don't have diabetes, are like, I live healthy. Other people should live healthy. But whatever these pharmaceutical companies are charging for this medication or say you need a a different medication, that's why your hospital premiums are so high. Your insurance Mm -hmm. bill is so high. So even if you don't have diabetes or even if you know somebody that has a chronic condition, these pharmaceutical companies, yes, you want to make a profit, but marking it up 500% for a life-saving medication. You don't care about people. You don't care. We're not living in some utopia of a world where everyone makes not only just like bare bones, a living wage, not talking about minimum, right. but living wage, but like everybody is flourishing. Everybody's a millionaire. So sure, you can charge $300 a vial. Like, no, people are struggling. And Tavia was working two different jobs that she still couldn't afford your ridiculously priced vial of insulin. It's insane. And uh, a federal appeals court acknowledged that the drug gouging law was unconstitutional, but still today, companies are charging a ridiculous amount of money over 500% for life-saving medication, and they continue to raise the price. Antonet also pointed out how pharmaceutical companies will say, oh, we have programs to help those in need. And I've even seen that myself on like commercials, because again, America is special and that we have So many pharmaceutical companies having their commercials on TV where it's just like, let us know, reach out to us if you need help affording this. But those programs are very hard to qualify for. And 
like you mentioned too, Jasmine, with like the program that Antavia ended up aging out of, you have to be below the poverty level for most programs to even qualify, which it puts people who are in that middle ground of you're still struggling to get by, but you know, you make a little bit too much money, even though you're barely really covering all your expenses to live, that then you don't qualify for that. So for a working middle-class mom, Antavia pointed out that she did not qualify for assistance. And her daughter's situation points out how a working young adult cannot afford the medication. And unfortunately, because of that, Antoinette constantly worries about Antonique when she graduates and starts her career that she won't be able to obtain health insurance that will cover the cost of her diabetic care. And Antoinette is quoted as saying, I'm also scared that the deductibles and co-pays will be astronomical and that she will be forced to choose between repaying her student loans or repaying for the medical supplies and diabetes medication that keeps her alive. It's sad that you have to choose between, you know, feeding yourself, clothing yourself, providing basic needs for yourself. And also you need this life saving medication because Mm -hmm. it's so ridiculous. And when you come out of school, if you it takes time for you to get a job, are there going to be programs out there that will assist you or will you have the right insurance that will be able to cover your medical expenses? Say you get a job but they have limited insurance and the -hmm. cost of your medication is $1,300. It's so many things you have to think about. Yeah. And our healthcare system has so many people falling through the cracks. So many, like, yeah. And unfortunately, Antavia is just one of so many that ended up falling through the cracks where that shouldn't be the case. And especially given that, like you were pointing out with type two diabetes, I think a lot of people want to be like, well, you should just live healthy and you should do this and you should do that. We're also talking about people with type one diabetes. Like this is, you Mm -hmm. just get it. There is no preventing it. You have it, you have it. And it's because your body is not producing and doing things that, you know, other average bodies are doing. So there is no, just live a healthy lifestyle. No, you need that insulin. You need that. And yes, living a healthy lifestyle will help the quality of your life, but you will forever need to receive that. So Mm -hmm. it's really about fixing our trash system that clearly does not care about people, at least certain Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just... It's so terrible. Yeah, it's just sad. If you are enjoying this episode, you should consider buying us a coffee. Yes, a coffee. That small gesture will help us continue to create quality episodes and content. Click the Buy Me a Coffee link in the show notes or check out our website at distrustanddisparities.com. In addition to protesting and speaking to Congress and also going on various news outlets, Antoinette, she started the nonprofit organization called T1 Diabetes Journey. The organization serves as an advocate for awareness and wellness by providing support and assistance to diabetics during their maintenance journey. Their mission is to bring diabetes awareness to the community by educating, supporting, and advocating. They stress the importance of diabetes management, medication, self-care, wellness, and nutrition. On the website, which you can find the link in the show notes, you can find a variety of resources, including links to the latest diabetes education and also various programs to help you save money on your prescription drugs. Make sure you go support Visit their website and also follow the T1 Diabetes Journey on Instagram at T1 Diabetes Journey. They're also on Facebook at T1 Diabetes Journey and also on Twitter by the same name. And we'll have all that information in the show notes. But Antoinette is doing her job to not only advocate for her own child, but also other 
diabetics, specifically type ones diabetics that are going through the same problem and just advocating for systemic change, which is needed. We hope to continue this conversation and bring on a diabetes expert so that they can continue to educate us how we can advocate for ourselves and just learn more about this chronic illness. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Do you have recommendations for topics we should discuss about health disparities or injustices? Guests we should interview doing amazing health justice work? Or organizations we should highlight creating positive change for marginalized communities? Please visit us at distrustanddisparities.com or email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you.